Our great Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the truth. We thank you that you've given it to us for our building up and edification, for the growth, for discipleship, and also for your glory, Lord. And I pray that we would be pointed towards you, pointed towards your salvation, pointed towards your gospel. And I pray that even as we walk through these, uh, this book of Genesis, that we would be able to see you so clearly in its pages and the hope that you give us. And we thank you, Lord, for this. Um, praying, praying that as we uh, discuss sin and all the things surrounding that, that our hope would be in you, Christ Jesus. And so we thank you for these things. Um, work in us, I pray, by it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today in our passage, we're going to be hearing a word. And that word is cursed. Cursed are you is the phrase that you'll hear as a matter of fact. And what may be even more surprising for many is that that word, that phrase, cursed are you, comes from as declared by the mouth of God. Because after the fall of mankind, brought on by Adam and Eve's disobedience, God pronounces curses. Curses on the serpent who deceived and on the ground that Adam would work. And thus begins from here and right through the rest of Scripture, right across it, we start to indeed see this image of God both blessing and cursing. Blessing and cursing. In fact, that's a major theme in all of Genesis. Blessing and cursing. And I would suspect that we love to talk about the God who blesses, but rarely do we enjoy nor stomach the idea of a God who doesn't just bless people, but also curses them. He curses this world, and indeed, the curse has touched every single one of us. And we see the first account of curses, of this particular curse here in Genesis 3. And we're going to expand on that in just a moment. But first, I would like us to read our passage from Genesis chapter 3 and look uh, at verses 14 to 21. And look at what God is doing here in this whole idea of cursing. And so I want you to see here as we read this that the curses that God pronounces and how it begins kind of that pattern of curses and blessings. And so the consequence of the fall and sin, and indeed we're going to see the hope that God places here in the midst of curses. And so that's the other part. It's not just curses, but the hope that God puts in the midst of curses. And it's funny that it's the hope candle that we lit today because very much so that's a part of what we're going to be talking about. So turn with me if you can. Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. We're also going to have it up on the screen. And we're going to read this together. So remember where we've been. Adam and Eve have disobeyed God. The fall happened. And then God comes to them and he says, where are you? What have you done? And Adam and Eve make excuses and try to snuff off their sin. And it goes all the way through from Adam to Eve to the serpent. And here's where God speaks next. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. And on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife 
his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. So as you can see by what we just read, that after Adam and Eve sinned, God pronounces these curses. And consequences for sin was brought down on Adam and Eve. Consequences that are with humanity to this very day. And as I said, you may be surprised to read that it was God who pronounced the curse upon us due to our sin. So this forces us to first ask a question this morning, and I think we need clarity on. What is a curse? What does that mean when we talk about a curse? And before I unpack that for you, I'd like to just suggest that you go and watch a magnificent sermon by R.C. Sproul called The Curse Motif, where he does a masterful job at explaining in more detail than I will today what the Bible means when it says curse. And much of what I'm about to say about the curse is from many of his works and thoughts and guidance. When we typically think about the curse in our culture, we tend to think about witchcraft or voodoo, right? We have watched enough Disney cartoons to think that a curse is something a witch does, and thus we often associate curses with evil, witchcraft. That's why we can be uncomfortable with the idea that God here pronounces a curse or curses. But when we look at curse in the Bible, we see that it is certainly different than what we typically think of in our culture. If we can boil down this idea of cursing to its simplest form, we would say that curse is the opposite of blessings. Curse is the opposite of blessings. The curse is an authoritative pronouncement by God against someone or something that revokes his blessing and by nat natural consequence, leaves the person or thing in their misery. It's almost punishment. When we see that idea of blessings and curses, we see that all throughout Scripture. And that's why there, you have to kind of walk through Scripture to get a full picture. In Deuteronomy 28, when, when the law was given to them at Mount Sinai, we see this exchange between blessings and curses uh, when God gives the law. And it reads like this. I'm just going to read from Deuteronomy 28 for you. He says to them, If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all of His commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all the blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, Blessed shall you be in the city, blessed shall you be in the fields, blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, and it goes on and on and on about blessings because of the obedience of Israel. But, later on, it says this, but if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall, you be, shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground and the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall, be you, sh shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. And so as you can see, there's this blessing brought from obedience to the Lord and then there's this cursing pronounced by God for disobedience to the Lord. Blessing brings this fruitfulness and a joy with God, whereas this curse brings desolation and unfruitfulness and no peace between man and God. And according to Sproul, perhaps the, the closest look at the difference between blessing and curses, he says, can be found in the benediction from Numbers. And we all know this benediction. It says, may the Lord bless you and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. There's blessing. There's this blessing from the Lord. And as you read that, if you get into kind of Hebrew writing, there's every single one of those lines is just a parallel of each other, right? May the Lord bless you and keep you. What does that mean? Well, it means that he causes his face to shine upon you and is gracious to you. What does that mean? That the Lord turns his face towards you and gives you peace. 
Blessing is to have the gracious face of God shining upon us, not turned away, not forsaking us, but shining on us as we bask in the glory and the peace of God. Blessings is God keeping us and being gracious to us. And with His face towards us, we have this peace with God for He looks on us not just as a a judge, but as a father who loves us. Indeed, we long, don't we, for that day when we will see God face to face. It's like the greatest blessing of all. We long for that as God's people. But to be cursed is to turn that benediction backwards and upside down to the opposite side. And instead we read, may the Lord curse you. May he damn you. May he anathematize you. May he turn your, his face away from you, condemn you. May you remain in darkness, and may you never rest. This is what a curse is. It's the opposite of blessing. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus cursing the fig tree, and it shrivels up and it dies, no longer produces fruit because it wasn't fruitful to begin with. God's face is turned away from it. Lastly, Galatians 3, we see Paul declare that if anyone preaches a gospel that is contrary to the one he preaches, even if it's an angel from the Lord, he says, if anyone preaches this false gospel, he says, may they be anathema, may they be cursed, may they be damned to hell. That's the seriousness of preaching a false gospel. God is holy and we are sinners. And God cannot dwell with sin. And so when sin is present, he turns his face. And with that turning, his special blessings as well. But God is not also not unable to save and redeem. The sin and the curse is not something he cannot overcome in his pursuit of us. And thus, even in the midst of curse imposed by God, there's hope given. Hope. That's the theme of today. There's hope, and that hope is in His Son, Jesus Christ. So I want us to take a moment with that understanding of curse, blessings and curses. I want us to take a moment and look at the curses and the consequences that have been put on the serpent here in Genesis 3 and what happens to Adam and Eve and the ground by which Adam is to work. Because there is a distinction here. He pronounces a curse on the serpent, and he pronounces a curse on on the ground, but not yet do we see the curse pronounced on Adam and Eve specifically, but there are consequences to their sins. So God begins in verse 14 by pronouncing a curse on the serpent. And what you will see here is the punishment fits the crime, okay? God is not haphazard with his judgments or declarations, but they have significant meaning as they match the sins of the individual. To the serpent, he starts with the curse and consequence of humiliation, humiliation. Because you have done this, you are cursed above all livestock, above all beasts of the field. And what did he do? He deceived, right? He came and he deceived Adam and Eve, and Eve specifically into sinning. He said, you're cursed above all livestock, above all beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go and eat the dust of the earth. There's this declaration by God that the serpent will be reviled and a hated animal. I'm sorry if you own a snake in here. Uh, in, con- in countries where snakes are commonplace, people tend to kill them when they see them. They don't like the snakes around. Most women I know don't enjoy snakes. Some of you do. But they can be a pest. They can be a danger. They're hated. But more than this, more than this, don't get caught up in that whole sentiment there. We see the declaration that this serpent will crawl in his belly and eat the dust of the earth. He'll eat the dust of the earth. It's this humiliation that has to happen. Now we know that snakes do not eat dust for food, but as it slithers along and flicks out its tongue, it smells with its tongue, it eats dust. But even more than this is the image that it bears. Adam is later told that he will die and return to what? Dust. Dust. Dust from the earth from whence he came. And so the consequence of the serpent Deceiving Eve and bringing about the death of Adam is that he will have to eat the dust, the death that he caused, a reminder even even today of his sin and his coming destruction, of his own death that is going to be declared. What's really interesting is in all uh, all of the declarations of the serpent of Eve and Adam, there is no hope given to the serpent whatsoever. 
Adam and Eve are different. God gives hope in those declarations, but in the serpent, none. Satan is in trouble. And so for this, we read next in verse 15, this idea of his own death as he eats the dust of the earth. Verse 15, that God will put enmity between the serpent and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, and he shall bruise or crush your head. It's a death blow, and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, he's saying to Satan, you may have deceived Eve, and in your moment with her on the, on the tree, defeated her in a sense by tempting her successfully to eat of the tree in the garden, but it's not over. This isn't over, because who will eventually be born in the offspring of the woman? Jesus Christ will be born of the offspring of a woman. And you, serpent, will not win that battle, for he will come and he will crush your head. This is not the last word. Your days are numbered, serpent, and her offspring is coming for you. That's the promise God makes to the serpent. Satan's ultimate demise will be from the seed or offspring of a woman, because from the offspring of a woman will come Jesus. He tempted her, he murdered her, but Jesus is coming from her and he will destroy you. And indeed he does. Indeed he does. He, Jesus comes. And since that, we know he's come. He's defeated sin and death on the cross. He's releasing the captives who are held in bondage by his resurrection. And he's been destroying the work of the devil. He said, I've come to destroy the works of the devil. I think about the demon-possessed people who he has released and those who he has saved from the grip of Satan. The seed has come, and in the midst of the curse, in the midst of the curse, we see the hope of God to save us from our adversary, to save us from the snake, from the serpent who came, from Satan, our adversary who is trying desperately to destroy us. I also agree with something that John Calvin taught about this, that the church throughout, through, or sorry, through the work of Jesus Christ will also be used to crush the head of, the Satan, of, of, of Satan underneath our feet. We read that in Romans 16, that the God of peace will soon crush Satan underneath your feet. And so here, there is something else about righteous followers of Christ and the church of God who are at work and being used by God to crush Satan beneath the feet of us. And do we not see that, right? As the gospel goes out, right? As we teach people about the gospel, people are freed from bondage and to sin and, to, and saved from death. As we pray, people are released from his grip. And as we tell the truth, his lies are defeated. And so there's something about that. As the Holy Spirit works in us, his deceptions and schemes are made apparent and we are discerning of his works. The Bible says, don't be tricked by Satan's schemes. And so there's something there too. We're equipped now to go, hey, I can see you, serpent. So we see that. The serpent here is cursed with no hope of redemption. Redemption is only extended to us. But the serpent's demise is promised. He will bruise the heel, but make no mistake, his head will be crushed. It's a death blow that will be struck, and Jesus has done it in him. We're no longer deceived and bound to death. We're no longer separated from God. We're free to behold him once more, to see his face. Now look to Eve. Starting in verse 16, God declares two consequences on her for her sin of listening to the serpent. Number one, God says he will multiply her pain in childbirth. You may ask why this would be the case. Well, it seems that what sin and the curse does is that it makes things that were once fruitful much more difficult. It frustrates those good things that we had. Our roles are made harder. And you know, women are literally built to have babies. You're amazing, creations of God. And that was one of the things that she was to do. She was to be fruitful with Adam and multiply. And so just like Adam was to work the ground, and yet his work would be frustrated, Eve, who was to bear children, would find that the work was to be frustrated, a little harder, a little more painful as a result of sin. Now it's worth noting 
I think that pain must have been a thing before the fall. For it says that here that he will increase her pain in childbirth. Not all pain is bad. It warns us of something, right? If you put your hand inside a fire, it burns you and it's supposed to burn you and you're supposed to go, ow, so that you don't burn the rest of you. And so there's nothing wrong with a little bit of pain in our lives. But the point here that is being made is simply this. I think that as a woman gives birth, and experiences the great pain of childbirth. And let's remember, like, giving birth today is very hard, and now they give you drugs to try to numb it, and there's all these ways that people are trying to lessen that pain. But as a woman gives birth and experiences the great pain of childbirth, she is to be reminded of her sin and her fall, and she's to be reminded of that sinfulness that we all have, the hardship is supposed to be connected back to the reality of our fallen state. So all suffering, I would say, does that to some degree in all parts of our life, not just childbirth. All suffering does that uh, for all of us. It's supposed to connect us back to the reality that this world is fallen. All suffering is meant to remind us that this world is not the place that it ought to be and we're not as we ought to be, all because of our, our sins. And that is supposed to throw us back up against the rock of our salvation and to cry out to God. And so even as her pain in the moments of birth reminds her that this is really hard. Why is it so hard? It reminds her of her sin and her fall. But the pain gives way to new life. And this is the beauty of this. The pain gives way to new life, a baby. Once again, a hope is declared that though death reigns in us, we live on through this new child, through the new life that is brought. God gives hope in the midst of the pain. God has not abandoned you. The pain of childbirth gives way to something beautiful. And so even in that moment, you see the, the, the fall and what it's done, increased cha- pain in childbirth. As you feel that pain, you're reminded, but then it gives way to the hope of God, this new life that God didn't just kill us then and there and stop humanity's existence. But no, the woman would be fruitful and there would be life that would continue because God is not done yet with us. That's beautiful. Do we see the purpose of God's declaration here? To point us to the gospel story. Sin brings curse and consequence, but God has not abandoned you. Jesus is coming and indeed he has come. There's hope in that message there. The second thing that Eve is declared upon by God is is her marriage would be frustrated. Eve had two roles given to her. Bearing children was one, and being the helpmate of Adam was the other. And this is the second thing that gets frustrated or bears consequence due to sin. Your desire will be for your husband, or contrary to your husband, some translations say, and he will will rule over you. Now some try to say that this means that headship and submission are a result of the curse or the fall. But that's a wrong way of looking at this. I want you to notice how in all the points in the passage, none of them are about changing the roles of men and women. None of them are about changing roles, but about frustrating what we already do. It's about frustrating what we already do. In this case, it's the marriage. So I take this to mean that as a result of sin, Eve will desire to control her husband, to take over his role and even perhaps undermine his role, but he will rule over her. Some may even insinuate dominate her. And so what happens to the marriage is the peace that they once had, working side by side in their perspective roles, would become fallen and broken. She wants his job and he'll abuse his power. Rather than willing submission and servant leadership done in love, as Ephesians 5 talks about, we'll have infighting and coercion and manipulation and abuse of all sorts. To keep a marriage strong and healthy, we will have to require much more work. It will require guarding it and being purposeful in it and following in the example of Jesus in it. Indeed, in the battle of the sexes that we see in our world, I see the fingerprints of the fall and the curse all over it. The roles of men and women are being upended, forgotten, abused, and even the church 
we're, seen, we're sinning by not holding true to the Scripture's teaching on it. And so we have this call to you ladies. Put yourself in these verses. See how you are affected by the fall and the curse and look to the hope that God has put all through this for you. That every time you have a baby, every time you give birth, there's a, there's a, there's a message of hope from God that he loves you and he's working in us. Finally, he turns to Adam. Adam is given the last word for he is the one ultimately responsible. He is the one who was in charge of leading his family and he will be the one who God declares the greatest judgment of all, death. Death. God says to Adam in verse 17, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Now when it says that it was a bad thing that Adam listened to the voice of his wife, we, get, we kind of get thrown back by that for a moment. Uh, he means that Adam should have listened to the voice of God first. It's not meaning that you shouldn't listen to the voice of your wife, guys. <laughs> we need to listen to the voice of our wife. They are our helpmate. But in this sense, he listened to Eve who told him to eat of the tree that God said not to eat from rather than listen to the voice of God. Adam should be leading from the direction of the Lord God. Men should lead their homes according to the direction of God and His Word. All these voices in the world are calling you to do this and do that and what you are being called to from very creation mandate. We are being called to first listen to the voice of God. So I don't care if it's your wife or your husband or your child or your girlfriend or your boyfriend. You listen and obey God's voice first and always. That's the first. But it says, because he did not listen to the voice of God and sinned against him, we see the second curse pronounced by God. Cursed is the ground, he says. Adam was from the, from the ground, and he was to work the ground as a farmer or gardener, and now the ground will bring forth thorns and thistles. You're going to have to labor and sweat and be in pain, it says, just to bring forth a little bit of food to eat and remain alive. Adam's sin spoiled the environment and the very ground he was to work. All that we put our hands to, all the work that we put our hands to, we will work and break our backs for less fruitfulness than we would have had in the garden before the fall. Men, we're going to have to work hard and break our backs to stay alive and keep our families alive. And although we already preached on it earlier, work is a good thing that God gave us. But now, even though we work hard, our fields, whatever they may be, whatever your field is in life, it will not produce as they once did. But once again, even in this, there's hope. There's hope again because we are not entirely cut off, but there will be some fruit that comes from our labors. God did not, in this cursing and consequence, bring about immediate judgment and death in its fullness. But in His mercy, there's some semblance for the woman and the man, that though the curse was upon us and though God was turning his blessings away, God was not finished with us. God had a plan. And though the ground was cursed, it would still yield some fruitfulness. So in the same vein as the woman, as we as men work and sweat and toil and suffer for livelihood, we are to be reminded of our sin we're to be reminded, man, this life is hard. This world is hard. It's hard to make a buck. It's hard to get food on the table for my family. Everything is hard. And as we look at that, we're to pull from that, that sin is real, that the fall was real, that we are sinners. And yet as we pull the fruit out of the ground and we put food on our table and our kids eat it, whenever we say grace, we should be reminded that God is good. There's hope in God. He's already looking after us, even in the midst of our sin and the fall. He's not abandoned us. When you really think about it, all modern advancements of technology and all those things, pesticides, herbicides, they're all our attempts. They're all our attempts to overcome the curse, right? Technology is supposed to make us work less hard, right? Herbicides and pesticides that we put on our crops are supposed to make our crops grow better. And yet... It's probably the very thing that's killing us. <laughs> it's probably the very thing that's also hurting us. The poisons that we put on our food and the things that we are eating. 
And this is the last consequence for Adam's men- Adam mentioned here. Death. God promised that if he ate from the tree and sinned against God, he would surely die. And indeed, that is true. God is no liar. He says here, and God says, from dust you came and from dust you will return in verse 19. The reality is, no matter how much we try, no matter what medicines we put in our bodies, no matter what vaccines we make, no matter what we do to produce all these things, death will eventually win. Death always beats the medicine. Eventually, no matter what we try to stop it, every open casket declares it. We have a 100% chance of dying. This is the ultimate consequence for sin. We talked about it in other passages, um, death physically, death spiritually. And we know it. Death feels wrong. It feels not right. We weep at death of those who we love because we know that it would be better if they remain together with them. We want to be with them. We want to continue to see them and walk with them. We want to have their life in our life again. Death is a terrible consequence of sin. And yet, for the believer in Christ, it has no sting, the Bible says. For death is the gate that leads us to everlasting joy. There has been pictures of hope all through this. There have been pictures all through this of hope uh, as God pronounces his curses. There's also hope. I'm not done with you yet. What about this one? What about death? Where is the hope that God gives to Adam and Eve and indeed to us that death, though it is a result of a sin, that God is not done with us yet? Well, verse 20 to 21. The man called his wife's name Eve Because she was the mother of all living, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So God takes and kills an animal, we're assuming, and he brings it death and makes them clothes from its skin. And as they wore the skins of a dead animal, you could think they've never worn anything like that. They're wearing the skins of a dead animal, it's a constant reminder of the vileness of their sin. It brought about death. They were reminded of their sin and consequences. That's also why in the, in the rest of the Old Testament, when they're slaughtering the animals and, and putting them out and they're draining blood, it would have been a disgusting picture of butchery as they're doing the sacrifices. It's meant to be. You're supposed to see what sin has done. You're supposed to see what death looks like because of our sin and be reminded of the great need for salvation. And so here they were reminded of their sin and its consequences just by wearing these clothes. But, like everything else here, what we see here is that instead of just instant, deserved death coming to Adam and Eve, God in his mercy brings death to this animal and uses its skins to make a garment to cover them and their nakedness. So right before he sends them out of the garden, right before he's about to kick them out of the garden, his last kindness to them is to pass this immediate death onto something else and to cover their shame. You can see where this is going. Here's the hope, the foreshadow of the mercy of God. And it is foreshadowed again and again. When Abraham is asked by God to sacrifice his son Isaac, Right before he brings down the knife, God stops him and provides a ram in his place of his son. We see God providing, God's mercy. When the angel of death is to come and wipe out the firstborn males in Egypt, a lamb is provided so that by its blood, death will pass over their home. And in this we see God's mercy. On the Day of Atonement, an animal is sacrificed to pay for the sins of Israel rather than have the people of God destroyed in their sin. In this, we see God's mercy. Folks, we're talking hundreds of years between these events. God is laying out His hope, His mercy, His plan, starting right back in Genesis. But the ultimate picture, as we know, is we're heading there, and the fulfillment would be when Jesus would be sent. When Jesus would be sent to earth, the Son of God, instead of Isaac's son. It's God's son. It's the Father's son. The Son of God to die in our place. And here we see the hope of God in the midst of the curse. God would provide a Savior, a spotless lamb to to die instead of us. We read in Scripture, whoever believes in Jesus, though they die, yet shall they live. 
in Christ, we're given this eternal life with him. We're coming now to Christmas, and eventually we will likely sing Joy to the World. And do you remember the one line in there? He comes to make the blessings flow as far as the curse is found. Here's what we read in Galatians 3. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do, and do them. None of us can do all the works of the law. None of us can be good enough. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather. The one who does them shall live by them. Now listen to this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, it's us, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Christ has redeemed us by becoming a curse for us. As, as Jesus hung on that tree, he took our sin, he took our guilt, he took our shame. And what happened when Jesus became our sin? It says, the Father turned his face away. It was that moment where the blessing was removed and Jesus became our curse. And he was forsaken by the Father, taken outside of the camp, condemned, and he suffered the shame and the guilt and indeed the death. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, he says. Why have you turned your face away from me and left me in this result? So in that moment, as R.C. Sproul put it so well, Jesus became our curse. And instead of God bless you and keep you, it was said of Jesus, may God damn you to hell. I don't mean that in the swear word. I mean that in the, in the truth of it. May he curse you. God, turn his face away from you. God, take away your peace and keep you in darkness. That's what happened to Jesus on our behalf, on that cross. And what was placed on all those who would believe in Christ? God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace, shalom, Peace with God. It pleased the Lord to bruise his son. It was pleasing to God to judge our sin and our wickedness in his son. He became sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. And he redeemed us by becoming a curse for us. So, yes. God pronounced a curse on us. Yes, God handed out righteous, authoritative consequence and judgment and the consequences on us, on us for our sin. Yes, he inflicted us and this universe with great frustration and pain. But as he handed out that curse, his plan all along was to not have us suffer the curse forever. But one day, God himself, Jesus Christ, the Father's own son, would come and redeem us by becoming the curse for us. And by doing that, all who are in Christ will enjoy the blessing of seeing his face, being kept, being loved graciously by him. This is why we preach the gospel, because it's our only hope. Jesus is our only hope, and he's the only hope for our world. That's why we need to boldly proclaim this to the world. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. That's all of us. That's everywhere. Once again, from the very beginning of our Bibles, we praise God for his son and for his plan of redemption through him. So let us go boldly out. This Christmas especially, let us go boldly out and preach this gospel to the entire world, touched by the curse People wonder why the world is so hard, why life is so hard, while the world is the way it is, why we are the way we are. We go out into the world, touched by the curse, in need of redemption, we tell them that one has come, 
One has come who's bringing blessings, who can save us from this curse. That's our great hope. What an incredible passage. Even as God cursed, he planned to come, and indeed he has. And as we talked about today, we live in that hope now. We live in it now, enjoying that fact that God has his plans and he's carrying them out. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. And Lord Jesus, we cannot fathom what it was like for you on that cross as the Father turned his face away from you. But we thank you, Lord, so much for the truth that because he's turned his face away from you in that moment, he turned his face upon us because we received a righteousness that was not our own. We received a righteousness that is from you, Lord your righteousness. And Jesus, you took our sin and curse upon yourself. That exchange doesn't seem fair for you. And we are overwhelmed by your love and grace in our life. I'm praying, Lord, that as people hear this, as people maybe who don't know you again, people who have not received you as Savior, I pray that as they see the picture from Genesis all the way through the New Testament, of what you've done, they'll see that this is truth. This is truth, Lord. That they would give their lives to you. Draw them to yourself, I pray. Lord, go with us and help us. Help us to be so enraptured by our own salvation, our own, the own grace that you've poured out on us, that we would want everyone to hear and know about it. That our passion that flows from that will go out to others who we meet and walk with this Christmas season and forevermore as well. So thank you, Lord, that you became a curse for us to redeem us. We praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.